as you now know, Don Berwick, who uh, became the head of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, wrote an article back in Health Affairs in 2008 where he and several colleagues said, what we have to do is move to three goals for our healthcare system. We need to have better health for the population. We need to have better health care and we need it all to cost less than it does. So let's talk about better health. Here is a... Here's poor David. You know, somebody got the bright idea to send him off to a two-month trip in the United States and... He's just not the svelte young Florentine he used to be because he's, uh, he's now, he's an American. In fact, as we know, about two-thirds of U.S. adults now are overweight or obese. We're on our way to having 80% of U.S. adults be overweight or obese by the year 2030. And as the comedian Stephen Colbert says, what that means is that by the year 2030, 80% of U.S. adults will be 160% of U.S. adults in terms of total mass. <laughs> so... <laughs> and... It would be bad enough if it was just weight, but of course, sadly we know, obesity is highly correlated with cancers, with diabetes, with other forms of, of chronic illness. So you know, we won't be laughing our way uh, around the dinner table at that point. We know that, uh, as you can see there, 28% or so of U.S. adults are physically inactive. We still have almost one in five U.S. adults smoking, despite the clear-cut evidence that it impairs our health. We have a large no a share of the population under stress, and we also know now that stress is not just a bummer. Uh, stress actually produces excess hormones that act in your cells to undermine the functioning of those cells. So stress and what's now even called toxic stress can also seriously undermine your health. And again, I ask you, where are you in America? Uh, what does it mean to be an American? And what are the rules that we're going to set to govern and predispose you to better health? A really critical qu can, uh, question. So I talked about better health. What about better health care? Well, you've heard a lot about the inadequacies of health care this week, including from uh, Chris Castle yesterday with her terrific uh, discussion about the Choosing Wisely campaign. The Institute of Medicine, again, back uh, in the early 2000s, came out with a very important study that was called Crossing the Quality Chasm. We had this yawning gap in the quality of U.S. health care that we had to get across. And basically, the study said, for well-insured Americans who have access to the best health care, you can get the best health care in about any place in the world. If you are well-insured, you can go to the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic. But we have some problems with our health care system. It's not as safe as it could be. It's not as effective as it could be. I mentioned a half of uh, health care might have no evidence that it works. It's certainly not that patient-centered. Anybody who's had a serious illness or has had a relative who's had it and has been bounced around the healthcare system knows that. It's not as timely as it should be, uh, it's not as efficient as it should be, and it's certainly not as equitable as it should be. Other than that, it is a great system, but it does have <laughs> these issues. And we can ask, how much has changed? Well, safe, we know from the research that one in three hospital admissions is associated with an adverse event, like a medication error, for example like acquiring a uh, pressure ulcer, which can predispose you to an infection and even death. Not so good on the safety front. Effective, as I mentioned, about half of the care that we provide has no evidence that it works. Patient-centered, again, ask anybody who's had a serious illness whether they've thought the system was organized around them and their needs. Timely, well, we know that about one in four diagnoses are incorrect. If you're incorrectly diagnosed, it's not likely you're going to get appropriate care at the time that you need it. Often people have to go months or even years before they get the correct diagnosis. And efficient, as we know, uh, it is clearly not the case that the system is efficient. So equitable, I mentioned you know, the disparities that we have around the country about health care, and I'll say more about that in a moment. So we've made some progress, but not as much as we need to undertake. 
Chris and Harvey talked about the waste in healthcare. I won't dwell on that. We know that it's big. It could be, as you heard uh, from them, as much as a third of the dollars that we spend on healthcare. So just think of us as taking lounges of piles of dollar bills and shredding them up and throwing them in a waste bin. That's really what we're doing. Why are we doing this? Well, lots of reasons. Another very important study the Institute of Medicine released recently was on geographic variations in healthcare. And again, let's go back to that question of what does it mean to be an American? In terms of what you get in healthcare, it depends on where you are. Your uh, geography is going to dictate this much more than your anatomy is going to dictate this. Uh, the dark colored states are the states that spend more on Medicare. The light colored states are the states that spend less on Medicare. You can see in some parts of the country we spend about five times as much as other parts of the country on Medicare. And you will be interested to know when, we, when researchers ask what's the effect of this, the effect is it appears to kill people a little faster to subject them to more health care. Why? Well, if you're in the hospital, you're more likely to have an adverse event, a hospital-acquired infection, et cetera. If somebody's doing things to you, it's quite likely some of those things are not going to be evidence-based and will actually harm you. Why is this happening? The Institute of Medicine said it's happening for different reasons, whether you're in Medicare, whether you're in Medicaid, or whether you're in private health insurance. In Medicare, it's heavily driven by, believe it or not, what's called post-acute care. That is to say, everything that happens to you once you get out of the hospital. So it's whether you get home health care, whether you're put into a nursing home, whether you're shuttled back and forth between a nursing home and a hospital. All of that in certain parts of the country is going on much more than in other parts of the country. Now, I just want you to close your eyes and imagine home health care agencies making money off of providing care to people in their homes and what would motivate them to provide a lot of care for people, whether they needed it or not, right? Uh, and so we appear to have a lot of that going on. Some of it is probably fraudulent activity, or at least what we call abusive activity. That's the fundamental driver of the differences in Medicare. We also have some differences in the rate at which people are hospitalized. In private health insurance, the variations are all over the map also, but they're driven by different prices. The prices that are charged in different parts of the country and by different providers for health care. That is a problem, and that is leading us to the problem of costs. Now, we don't need to say a whole lot about the cost of health care. And Tom Lee, who was the uh, former network president of uh, Harvard, the Harvard uh, Partner System, said it best. Uh, health care is a major headache that most of us will be coping with for the rest of our lives. Uh, it's worse than a headache. It's a migraine. We will probably never stop talking about the cost of health care. And we know whether we compare ourselves on the basis of total uh, gross domestic product devoted to uh, health care or per capita spending on health care, we're the black line at the top. We're the outlier compared to all the other rich countries who are s providing very good care for their citizens. So no matter how you look at it, we are the outlier. We know this is going to drive us bust over time. This, this is the graph. Just look at the trend lines up and up and up. What we're going to be spending as a share of the economy on Medicare and Medicaid in particular, and that's just in the public side of the system. It looks as bad in the private side of the system. We know that a lot of this is driven by higher prices. Uh, I was asked on uh, Jim Roselli's radio show this morning, we're number one in spending, right? Are we number one in anything else? Yes, we're number one in the prices we pay for health care. Uh, this chart was compiled by the International Federation of Health Plans. Almost any procedure that you look at, whether it's MRIs, whether it's a delivery, a normal delivery of a baby, we spend pay higher prices than almost every other country. And that is probably alone about half of the driver of our higher health spending. Well, why is this? Part, often because we don't know what the prices are. North Carolina has just passed a law stipulating that all hospitals will now spell out what their prices are so consumers can shop for them. Most of the time, we don't have that. It's also an exciting world, and as Don Berwick said, there has never been a better time to be an innovator at healthcare. Everybody who's out there who's engaged in some form of innovation in the system is excited 
about what's going on right now. Not afraid, because we know there's a lot of potential to do good. And if you think it can't be done, just remember what James Baldwin once said, which is, those who say it can't be done are usually interrupted by others who are doing it. That too, that too is part of being an American. It's going to be a different world. Bill Gates has a wonderful phrase, which is that we as Americans always tend to focus on the next couple of years, the change in the next couple of years, at the expense of thinking about how things are really going to change over the next 10. It will be a very different world if all of these forces play out for us in the U.S., and we hope a better one. Whose job is it to make sure it all happens? Uh, there may be some baby boomers like me in the audience who resonate with Jerry Garcia, the late great Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, who once said, somebody's got to do something, and it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be with you today.